Welcome to the Cedric Live Show. Today we have a guest in the house. Uh, he's extremely colorful. Um, not even in the way he dresses, in the way he speaks. Politics, economics, business, everything. Welcome to the show, my friend, Andrew Mwenda. Andrew, welcome. Pleasure. Pleasure to be hosted by you, my grandson, yeah. <laughs> Cedric. I know. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing very good. How are you doing? Good. Uh, it's nice to have you on the Cedric Live Show and we're honored to have you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, now tell me, you know, a lot of people, you know, read about you, uh, see you on social media, see you on television, um, but, but I want you to tell them, wh where was Andrew Mwenda born? When was he born? Where does he come from? I was born in Fort Porto, Western Uganda, in the great kingdom of Toro, in a town called Fort Porto, in 1912. At least that's what my birth certificate says. Now I'm 106. That's why I'm the grandfather of everybody in Uganda. Is that where the, the, the title Old Man of the Old Clan? Old Man of the Clan comes from there. You're 106 years old. Six years older than Nelson Mandela. I don't know when we're going to make Andrew Mwenda <laughs> serious, but anyways, we'll take his 106 years old. So, so I, I grew up in the most beautiful village in Uganda called Kanyandai. Everywhere you turn, there is a crater lake, and behind it is the beautiful uh, Ruenzori Mountains. Yeah. So if you're at my home, Ruenzori Mountain is like a, the fence behind our farm. Isn't that amazing? And then in front of us is a crater lake, on the side of us is a crater lake, and then the hills, you know, Fort Porto is undulating. It's the most beautiful part of the world. So why do you live in, why do you live in Kololo and not in... Uh... This is the whole problem. I think I'm crazy. You just need to be crazy to live in Kanyanda, to live in Kampala. Kampala is a dirty, congested, dusty, quarrelsome, chaotic, but it also has some life in it. A business activity and I walk in Kampala at night and I'm really impressed by the business acumen of so many ordinary Ugandans. Yeah, I've seen you walking in Kololo, in uh, in town. Even downtown, yes. Yes, I see you walking with your stick. Exactly. You know, to whip border borders. We're spying on you, so we know we know your <laughs> movement. So Are tell you me, working with ISO? No, no, no. Def, okay. no, no, no. CMI? No. ESO? No. Police? None of them. How come you're spying on me? No, I'm just following you. I'm a fan. <laughs> you know. Okay. So tell me, where did you go to school? So I go to school in a very small primary school called Rutoma. I think it must have been the worst school in the whole country. Only that two Why years ago, <laughs> listen to this. Only I was the first person to get the first grade in P7. And the P7 arrived when I was also getting into P7. Because it was always P5 when I reached P6, they put their P6 when I reached P7, they put their P7. But the interesting thing is two years ago, Kabarole was the best district in PLOE in Uganda. My primary school, Rutoma, was number four. Up to now, I still think they gave them the wrong results. How can Rutoma be number four in the best district in the country? I can't believe it. Perhaps it shows the steady progress NRM claims to have brought. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So from there, you went to, I think you told me. I that. went to Nyakasura School, Mbara yeah. High School, Soga College, Mwiri, Makere University, University of London. But you've also done some other stuff at Stanford. Stanford, and... Yale, Oxford. I went there to do postgraduate courses in philosophy, politics, history. Well, we can tell because, you know, you do quote a lot of things. So you must have read a lot of books. I know reading books is one of your favorite pastimes. Because I visited you and you have this beautiful library. Uh, and I think that... Have you read all the books in that library? No, 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 no. no. I buy anything between 300 to 400 books per year. I read about uh, three books a week, which is about 160 books a year. So I read half the books I buy, that is one. But I'm a compulsive book buyer, just like I'm a compulsive alcohol buyer. I don't drink alcohol in the mainstream, but uh, I stock a lot of alcohol in my house. I have a lot of books, which I, can, I know I can never read. But uh, to read books, you must have a lot of books. It's like taking pictures. If you're going to publish one picture of a tomato, you may need 1,000 pictures and you select from that one. So at any one time, I select which book I can read. And mm. at any one time, I'm reading five books at a go. What's your favorite book this year? Huh. There is a book I read by Graham Elson called uh, Destined, for, Destined for War. Can America and China Avoid the Thucydides Trap? It's a powerful book because China is the world's largest economy now by purchasing power parity. Yeah. And it's emerging on the horizon yeah. and have, has overtaken America. What is going to be the position of America? Can America accept to lose the number one position peacefully? 
Now, this guy argues that over the last 500 years, out of 15 cases where a dominant power has been challenged by an emerging power, 12 out of those 15 cases, there has been war. And in the three cases when there has not been war, which is Portugal and Spain, that I can accept, but if you look at when America overtook Britain, the problem was that Britain was facing a bigger problem near home, which was Germany. Germany right. and the United States emerged and overtook Britain at the same time. So Britain's biggest problem at that time was the threat of Germany, which was geographically near. So it allied with America against Germany. So that's why I think it was peaceful. So I would say that's a special case. So what, what's this book called again? Destined for War. Now let me, let me go to the next question. Destined for War. Yes, okay. I think we'll have to go and look for it when we get into one of these Barnes and Noble stores or yes. something or go online on Amazon. Amazon. Yes, Amazon, and we'll, we'll, we'll read it. And then me and you can compare notes over yes. a cup of uh, coffee. Yes. Now, tell me, everybody knows you in many capacities. First of all, you're known as a, a journalist. Uh, you're known as a businessman. You're known as a, an influencer these days. So, uh, And a responsible family man. And a responsible family man. Now, tell me, was journalism part of your plan as a child? Was it something? Was yes, it a, yes, yes. Was it something you wanted to do? Yes, I became a journalist when I was six years. In 1978, Idi Amin invaded uh, Tanzania. Right. And uh, my dad and his contemporaries would sit on radio and listen to the news on BBC, Deutsche Welle, Radio South Africa, Voice of America. And then after listening to the news, they would discuss the implications of what the, the news. Yes. So the next morning, I would go to school and call all my classmates and report to them the news and regurgitate the arguments my dad and his contemporaries made. So I became, I did not have a radio station or a newspaper. Mine was journalist by word of mouth. Six years, that's when I became a journalist. And I've been a journalist since. Six years old? Yes. They say that journalism is the first draft of history. Do you agree? I think so, yes. Why? Because history is the coverage of past events. And journalism is the most immediate coverage of those events. The historian takes a distance from the news, but he just relies on the reports of journalists to, to provide a longer-term perspective of what was happening. Now, when it's all said and done, what do you think your contribution will have been? Well, I look at my contribution as promoting... Look at The Independent, for example. The Independent right. was created as a platform to provide a platform for the free discussion of ideas. Let me go one step back. We, we may, you know, on these shows, we make a lot of assumptions. Mm. When you say the independent, what is the independent? The independent in, is a newspaper or a news magazine, as Ugandans want to call it. The most influential, the most intellectual, the most investigative newspaper in this country. So if you want to read the real journalism, in Uganda, read the independent. If you read the others, you are downgrading your intellectual capabilities. So... So really, I am, if I'm to be remembered for anything, it is promoting free democratic debate. From my childhood, as I've told you, at six, I would watch my dad discuss current affairs with his contemporaries. My dad was a civil servant, these people were civil servants and businessmen. And I would listen to them and go to my school and create an atmosphere or a situation where we, me and my six-year-old colleagues, could discuss current affairs. They could be national, regional, continental, or, or international. So what do you think about journalism in Uganda? Do you think the profession has grown upwards, yes, sideways, yes, yes. backwards? Well, I can say that the Uganda, like the rest of the world, is a, and Ugandan journalism, is a meeting ground of very many contradictory movements. Right. Let me give you the positive aspect of Ugandan journalism. When I uh, I was admitted to Makere to do journalism. My dad was frustrated. He wanted me to do law. He was very angry because at that time, journalists in Uganda were, Museven used to say they are fishmongers, retired fishmongers, or tomato farmers, goat herders who would come into journalism. They were largely S4 graduates. Right. The newspapers did not provide much opportunity. Now, today, media houses in Uganda, television stations, radio stations, social media platforms, and new newspapers, they have become big business. When I joined the Monta in 1993, not a single person there had a car except our managing editor, and edit, our editor-in-chief, who was also managing director of the company, Wafolo Gutu, and all Ramshakold Mazida. Today, if you go to monitor, practically even an office messenger has a, uh, drives a car. Yes. So if you look at the size of uh, media houses as businesses, 
and the professionals who work in them. We have people with PhDs. We have so many people with masters. We have so many people with first degrees and we don't no longer have people who are not first degree holders. So journalism has grown in terms of, of size as businesses. It has grown in terms of diversity. At that time, we had one radio station, one television station. Now we have a million television stations, a billion radio stations. Yeah. We have a newspaper on every arm and leg of our existence because everybody with a, a page on Facebook really has a newspaper. And then, and then it has also grown in terms of intellectual competence, professional accomplishment. Yes. But there is also another thing that has happened. A lot, certain aspects of journalism have been adulterated by the emergence of uh, a, an extreme fanatical fringe, partly in the audience, partly also in journalism, that is intolerant, intolerant to open and free debate, which is the foundation of a democratic society. And do you think that is, do you think that is caused by the competition? Because there's so much competition in the market to produce news and, and catch eyes, you know, and, and get people to listen. Of course, creating scenarios like fake news, people coming up with all sorts of things that don't make sense. You know, there's some tabloid newspapers that are even very intrusive, you know, uh, and actually do cause damage to families, to, uh, uh, you know, individuals. Uh, so, uh, you know, it has grown. But I want to ask another question. I hear a lot. I should answer that. Answer there are that. Many okay. factors that have brought it about. One is the multiplication of so many media platforms, especially through social media. So the traditional media have to catch up with the traditional media, rather with the social media, because anyone can break news on social media, which is, <laughs> is not subject to restraints of yes. gatekeepers like editors. Yes. So the mainstream media are trying to catch up with the social media. That is one structural change. The other is Uganda is increasingly urbanized, increasingly educated, and increasingly more exposed. People's expressions have grown faster than the rate at which this country can provide them opportunities. The mismatch between people's expressions and the available opportunities is creating social frustration. Yes. That social frustration is a tinderbox. It is the, the uh, quarry that is manufacturing so much anger uh, and venom that you see both in traditional social media. So how do we, how do Ugandan journalists get um, internationally recognized? You've been internationally recognized. I know uh, Alan Kasuja, of course, now works for the BBC. Uh, you have uh, the lady in Kenya who works for uh, the BBC as well. She won the Kumlo Award. Um, how do you think Ugandan journalists can continue to be recognized or, or grow into those roles of international I should tell you this. It is a lesson you can draw from experience that fame is very easy to get. Excellence is very difficult. Excellence comes from a lot of hard work in developing the skills of a particular craft. If I was to advise young journalists is that they should look beyond fame. Yes. Many journalists in Uganda take positions in order to appear cool before the public, in order to agree with the existing public mood. That can give you fame, but it cannot give you excellence. Excellence, which leads international recognition, comes from you taking a lot of time to do good quality journalism, which involves a lot of research, a lot of reading, wide reading, and therefore a lot of reflection to reflect on events. Anybody can stand and say... You mean the neutral perspective. You have to have a neutral perspective. Not necessarily neutral, but reflective. You must have deep thoughts. Even yes. if you're critical, yes. your criticism must have profound thought behind it. Must you be see, subjective. Is exactly. That, yes. Let me give you an example. Anybody can stand and say Museven is a failure or a dictator or BCJ is incompetent, whatever it is. Yes. Those are very easy cliches to make. Yes. But to make an argument where even a professor at Harvard reads it or at Oxford and says we want you to come and be in our program yeah. and reflect on what you have written, it requires a lot of excellence, it requires a lot of reflection. Reflection comes upon research and upon uh, deep thoughtfulness. So do you think there are any young journalists at the moment you think who have that? Yes, yes, You yes, know, yes, yes. Uh, I've seen some, like I, there's uh, Qatar Raymond. Yes, I think yes. he's a... Uh, Raymond uh, Mujuni is very good. Raymond Mujuni. Uh, Kanari Mugumi. Yes, Kanari Mugumi. He's quite, he's a young yes. journalist. Ivan Okuda. Uh, yes. Any ladies? Say, um, the young ladies. I've seen Joy Bira. Joy Doreen Bira. Yes, although she left Uganda, now she lives and works in Kenya. Yeah, but she's still yes. our people, you yes. know. Joy. What about uh, Sheila? 
in the in the Uchile. Ah, Sheila, she's very good that one. Yes. In fact, isn't she going to stand for the recommended her to go to I think she's doing stuff. a course in England. I've seen some social media. Oh, things. she's on Shevening. I recommended her. I'm the, yes, I, I remember I wrote the recommendation for her for the Shevening. It's sad I had forgotten. Yes, Sheila, she's very good. Yes. She's very good. I've seen her interviews and her work on NTV. It's excellent work. Yeah, we have some young journalists at, at UBC as well, like Wadulo. Uh, they need a bit of uh, guidance. And uh, but why, why why don't you why do why don't you have a, a journalism institute? I mean, you're so experienced. But independent is a training ground for journalists. You should follow a journalist at independent called um, uh, Hagai Matsuko. Yes, I, I think do. he's the best investigative reporter. E each report he has done has caused a fundamental change. Like he did investigations on uh, the energy sector in Uganda, which led to the firing of many officials in the Ministry of uh, energy. energy and all the changes yes. that happened there. He did a lot of coverage on this Grand Bank issue. You can see now there is Kosasi. Each time he has focused on an issue, he has created change. There is a young lady at Independent also called Flavia Nakasi. She does reporting on health. You should read her work. There is uh, Ronald Musoke, excellent journalist. Independent producers, by the way, the best journalists in this country. You can even ask Monta New Vision because they have come and poached journalists. So maybe us. that's the legacy. That, that will be your legacy, them. that you pass yes. on your skills yes. uh, to other people. I know a lot of people have gone through your... Uh, you, you, un, you've gone under your tutelage and have gone, yes. to become, gone on to become great journalists. Uh, so right now what we're going to do is we're going to come back and I'm going to have a question for you. I read an article and this article uh, was in your last publication, I think the most recent one. I don't know if one has come out today, but it was Uganda's Painful Truth. Yes, this and, is last uh, week on Friday. I want you when we come back from the break to tell us in detail what this wait. article was about. Welcome back. We're still here with the old man of the clan, Mr. Andrew Mwenda. Now, Andrew, last week I, um, I read an article on, I know maybe it was this week, uh, and you wrote about the painful truth. And uh, the article uh, centered around this mantra that government is always to blame for, for what is happening with the youth in this country. Um, you know, yes, uh, we have had, I guess, rapid growth in G GDP, I think since 2006, somewhere to around 1.9% a year. But there's still a lot of complaints. So w what was the article about? Well, I think there is a sense in uh, Uganda that every failure in a country is produced by government. And it is something so perverse in Africa that somehow governments have to do everything. I'm sure you've watched a documentary called The Men Who Built America. Yes. When you watch that documentary, 10 hours of the transformation of the American economy from a backward agrarian economy to a modern industrial economy, you don't see anything called government. You look at business people engaging with society. If there are innovations, business people are willing to fund those innovations, not the government. I think that in Africa, we are living in a period where we are taught that the government does everything. In any case, government can only reflect the competencies, values, norms, habits, and mentalities of the people who make it up, who make up the society. The leaders of Uganda don't come from Sweden or Denmark or Ecuador. They come from Ugandan society. They reflect us. So I think that the change needs to begin at the societal level, that people need to believe that through their own initiative, they can make things happen. Get the example of Bobby Wine. He's always telling young Ugandans that somehow they are poor because of government, because of government policies. Now, Bobby Wine was, grew up in the ghetto, he says, very poor. He has a talent in music. He exploited that talent. Now he's a multimillionaire. In other words, there's nothing in the system called Uganda that blocked his progress. I can quote thou hundreds of thousands of Ugandans who have grown from extreme poverty to extreme wealth. Like yourself. Uh, unfortunately, I, one, I'm not rich, and two, I wasn't born in a, a poor family. I don't want to make that claim because I would be unfair to many Ugandans. I, I, was, I grew up in a basically a middle-class family, and I'm sure my dad, if he was uh, uh, still alive today, would be among the world's top maybe 5% of the richest people. Because he owned wealth, uh, a large dairy farm on about 200 or 300 acres of land, a lot of milk that he was producing. So he was a wealthy person. But what I'm saying for many Ugandans, so I had opportunity to, end, to go to any school I wanted. There are many Ugandans who did not have this opportunity. So I tell you, I was walking on Kampala behind Watoto Church. There is a new shopping mall. Yes. So I go to that shopping mall 
and uh, there is a, a supermarket. It's, I think, the largest supermarket in Uganda. I ask who owns this shopping mall, they tell me a woman called Frida. I ask uh, who owns the supermarket, they say the same person. So I call her, I get her number, I call her, I go to see her, and you know, she tells me, she can't speak English, she's never been to school. She tells me she started a small kiosk in Chikubo and has grown from a kiosk to a supermarket, from a supermarket to a mega supermarket to a shopping mall. She's a very wealthy person. You see, look at Sudir. He started as a taxi driver in London, came here with 25,000 pounds, and now he's a multi-billionaire in dollars, you see. So in other words, this country has opportunities for people to grow. Sitting and complaining on Facebook and hurling abuses and insults at others is certainly not a strategy for success. There are young people who have approached me from, through Facebook. I have helped them get scholarships. They have gone and studied abroad, and now they are some of the most successful professionals help connect them to somebody with business, they have started businesses and are thriving. In other words, success does not come from waiting for government, it comes from you utilizing your skills in order to be able to succeed in life. And those who are seated idle, complaining, I can tell you, complain, complain, until maybe the government of your choice comes to power and they make you an employee in ISO, an employee in the government and steal. Otherwise, how would you make money? You still want to make money anyway. Yes, so governments don't create jobs, the private sector does. And for the private sector to do so, people need to have a particular mentality, a mentality but, of I can do it. But some people say, you know, for example, if I look at the World Bank report of 2017, a third of Uganda's population, which is 10 million, 10, slightly over 10 million, live below the poverty line. How do you address this in the context think, of what you're saying? I think the elimination of poverty is a struggle that takes generations. You would need this country to grow at an average rate of about 10%. Yes. And also to be able to, and that would require heavy investment in manufacturing. You see, there are many gaps on the part of government. The government of Uganda does not have an industrial policy that seeks at the micro level, not at the macro level, at the micro level to encourage manufacturing to grow in this country. Government of Uganda doesn't have a good strategy on how to promote even exports. Government of Uganda doesn't have a strategy on practically anything. But in other words, yes, there are certain things we can blame government for. Yes. But for a lot of the failures I see with the Ugandans who are always complaining. You see, I, I'm doing a book on manufacturing in Uganda. So yes. I have like, talked to almost every manufacturer. So do you think it's a sense of self-entitlement? That let, they let believe that, they, yes, that, yes, that, yes. that government should do everything for them. Yes. But how do we address other issues that are beyond their control? Take, for instance, health. Today, if me and you had a car accident and we were unconscious, and nobody knew that this is Andrew Mwenda, or Cedric Babu, and they can't rush us to the best medical facility. What happens then? Let me explain to you this. First of all, we must remember that Uganda is a very poor country. Yes. In this financial year, government of Uganda is going to spend $7 billion. Divided by 40 million people, you get exactly $170 per person. Actually, it'll be exact $169.4 per person. So $170 per person. Let me ask you, Cedric, how much can you do with $170 for a whole year? Not very much. So in other words, regardless of all our ambitions, the biggest problem Uganda has is not a problem of corruption or incompetence. In fact, those are consequences. It has a problem of poverty. The government of Uganda does not have the resources to provide a large basket of public goods and services to the quality and quantity we deserve, we demand, we desire. It doesn't have them. So in other words, if a Ugandan got an accident, I can promise you, even with the best of intentions, without one, not one shilling being stolen, government of Uganda cannot treat everybody here. But aren't we barking up the wrong tree? I mean, I'm hearing a lot of stories about industrialization, about manufacturing, and everybody is, is, is running from the rural areas into the urban areas, expecting to get these opportunities. Why is it that we, we cannot encourage the youth to go back to your beautiful farm? Where did you say you're from? Kanyandahi. Why are you not encouraging these youngsters to go back to those areas? Uganda is the food, it's considered the food basket of Africa, or it has the potential to be the food basket of Africa. So and let me, let me wealth, tell you what, my what, criticism of agriculture. One, yes. there is not a single country in the world which depends on agriculture for 80% of its population that has a per capita income of more than $2,000. It does not exist. So to be involved in agriculture is to be poor. The development of any country has two forms of transition. The transition of most of these people from depending on agriculture for a livelihood to depending on industry and services, in a, that is one. The second transition is accompanied by the first, the movement of people from rural to urban areas. So when we see people leaving agriculture, 
to urban living agriculture to industry, rural to urban, it means they are coming into wealth. Let me give you an example. If you look at the poverty indices in Uganda, only 5% and only 7.5% of the people in Kampala and Wakiso districts live in poverty. Only 5% plus 7.5. So Kampala 5%, Wakiso 7.5%. Yes. They are followed by Ankole region, which is around about 8%. Then Lango region, which is about 17%. No, Ankole is 11%, Lango about 17%. In other words, the more urban people are, the better they are. So for me, I encourage people to leave agriculture and come to urban, uh, to industry, to leave agriculture, to come to uh, uh, urban areas. Now, the second thing is this. What is actually development? Hmm? Development takes place within a context of international trade. In international trade, some countries produce cotton, others weave cloth, others market high fashion. Some countries mine iron ore, others make steel, others market automobiles. How much you earn depends on your position in that international value chain. If you produce cotton, you only earn 2% of the international market price. Right. If you weave cloth, that's, Bangladesh, that's Uganda that first. Bangladesh, you weave cloth, make this cloth, you earn 15%. If you market high fashion, you are Italy and France, you are selling Dolce & Gabbana, Louis Vuitton, Burberry, uh, Hugo Boss, whatever it is, you earn 60 to 65% of the international market price. So that is, this, that is what distinguishes a poor country, a middle-income country, and a rich country. A poor country produces cotton, a middle-income country weaves cloth, and a rich country markets high fashion. But the the process of development is an upgrade from low value to high value products where you capture the highest value in the... Uh, but correct, this is what, but when I, when I talk about agriculture, I'm not simply talking about growing a potato or growing a pineapple. Take for instance, dried pineapple, grown out of organic products, attracts an extremely high rate in the US. Why is it that we're not focusing on those value adds within agriculture and getting people involved? USAID, the US government has talked about AGOA, the African Growth Opportunities Act. I mean, there is a huge, massive market, billions of dollars for dried pineapple. How many people are exporting it? So, so if you talk about agriculture, in other words, I would not encourage every person who has finished a university degree to go back. You see people like Robert Kabushenga. Yes. Who have gone back into agriculture to bring modern technology, modern ideas yes. into agriculture, whether it is irrigation, improved seed, uh, yes. use of fertilizer and other things. The, I, Uganda is poor because most of our people are subsistence farmers. A subsistence farmer is a person involved in agriculture basically for home consumption rather than for the market. Correct. So what we need is commercial agriculture. And the more yes. you commercialize agriculture, the more you will mechanize it. And the more you mechanize it, the more you need, you need large scale. In which case, those people who are uneducated we should leave villages and come into town. That's why I support land grabbers. If these land grabbers you are support agricultural... land grabbers? Look, if you read the development of Europe, there's something called the enclosure movement. The yes. first, the transition from feudalism to capitalism in Europe was occasioned by the massive ex expropriation of land from ordinary farmers to put into the hands of commercial farmers. That was the first transition, the agricultural revolution. The second transition was these people were thrown onto the streets. They had nothing to do. Then they were conscripted as cheap labor into manufacturing. That's how in the industrial revolution in Europe started. Can I tell you, the process of development is not kind. And those who are waiting for a kind process of development, in fact, I think that one of the reasons why Africa is poor is because the leadership in Africa, whether it's the bourgeoisie or the bureaucratic class in government and the political class, they are tied in a web of social obligations to their peasant kin. They are unwilling to, Im to inflict the is kind this, of... Is this where I read that you've lost all hope in African leaders? Uh, not I, I, no, I don't I, know if that was the exact <laughs> statement, but it was no, something like that. I lost my faith in the wickedness of African leaders. I used to think they are wicked. I lost that faith. This is what I'm telling you, that I think... African leaders are so humane. They are tied in a web of social obligations to their peasant kin and kith. They are not willing to inflict on them the kind of violence and the expropriation that the Europeans and the Asians have done to their own populations. The capitalist in Europe not only expropriated the peasant of his land, he crudely exploited the laborer in the factory. That is why the process of transition from feudalism to capitalism from poverty to wealth in Europe was accompanied by the evolution of many movements, social movements like communism, terrorism, anarchism, nihilism, uh, whatever you can, fascism, because Europe was convulsed in this, in the sense that popular classes were oppressed and exploited for which what to be created. Which brings me to my next point. Yes. Recently, I've been seeing 
a lot on anti-corruption. So when we come back from the break, you and I are going to discuss about this. That's a lot of baloney. Welcome back to the Cedric Live Show. I'm still here with the old man from the clan, Mr. Andrew Mwenda, who's educating us on the economics of Uganda and, and how best young people can get involved in this country. But Andrew, before we left, there's been a big push on anti-corruption. I see there's a, a new anti-corruption unit that's been set up and headed by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Edith Nakalema. Um, uh, we've been reading about uh, what's been happening with the IGG. Uh, what are your thoughts on this anti-corruption? I know you've said in the past that corruption is inevitable, but what are your thoughts on this? First of all, you see, there are two elements we need to deal with corruption. One, corruption as a moral problem. People get revolted when one individual gets money meant for everybody and takes it all by himself. Yes. People get angry. And it has been constructed uh, morally but that capitalism? as an unfair thing. Exactly. It has been conduct, constructed as morally unfair. You get it? To that degree, as moralists, we should stand in a firm and determined struggle against corruption. But where I disagree with practically the rest of the world is that corruption automatically stops a country from developing. That is the biggest religious cliche. Because you see, religion is based on faith rather than on fact. Cedric, every country that has developed during its intense period of transition from a poor to a rich country has been characterized by high levels of corruption, whether it's America, Britain, South Korea, or today, China. So the, any person who has read economic history yes. cannot deny what I'm saying, that the existence of corruption does not stop you from developing. So are you saying that it just depends on what you do with the corrupt proceedings? It, you see, to be honest with you, I don't know. You know why? Because corruption takes so many forms across so many activities, it's difficult to know, for me to know, which act of corruption harmed growth and which facilitated growth. It depends. Let me give you an example. If I steal money meant for a hospital here and I export it and I convert it into dollars, I send it to Switzerland, that will harm growth. You know why? Because it is a net deduction from the stock of wealth available in Uganda. I have exported it abroad. If I steal money meant for a road and people can never commu commute to that area, you get it? That means business will not happen in that area. Yes. But let me give you an example. Assuming I stole money meant for a hospital, the hospital was not built. But I went and bought a house in Kololo from Mukwano. Mukwano is a nationalist. He gets his money and invests it in, in a factory. And this factory in the next 20 years produces a company the size of Google or, or Apple or, or, make, or Samsung. The benefits from Samsung are much better than any hospital that would have been built in Kanungu. In other words, the effect of corruption on an economy depends on a very specific context. But aren't you, mm. aren't you in effect encouraging corruption? I don't know. You see, I also when you say this, you know, you gave the example of buying the house in Kololo from Mukwano, who puts it into his industry and, and, creates, I, and creates something else, right? Now, take for instance, I'm sure you've read about the CEO of Huawei. Mm. He's in a lot of trouble right now mm. on corruption. Then there was the issue with the Samsung, yes, uh, the Samsung CEO or chairman, mm. whatever mm. it was. Mm. Now, it's a vicious cycle in terms of Let me put one thing. Like this. Samsung, yes produces 40% of South Korea's exports, 36% of its GDP. Can you believe that? That Samsung, the people who created the rulers of South Korea, the last two presidents of South Korea who transformed that country, Chang Du Hwan and Tai Won Ro, in 96, were convicted for corruption and both admitted to having accumulated, each one of them, $700 million of fortune when they were in government. By the way, today's equivalent of 1.2 billion. So whether you, you have, uh, crooked leaders, it really doesn't matter. I think that corruption is not our biggest problem. As a moral problem, yes. As a political problem from 70, yes. But as a developmental impediment, we need to deal with two things. If you're going to want to develop, one, can we upgrade from exporting cotton to weaving cloth to marketing high fashion? Can we move up that value chain? Two, in moving that up that value chain, can the control of that value chain be in the hands of indigenous, national, domestic Ugandans? whatever word you use, but they must be national. Because foreign companies 
Museven is obsessed with foreign direct investment. I can promise you, you're Eric, foreign direct investment has never developed. In a country, it will not develop Uganda. Why is foreign direct investment- Repatriation of funds. Well, I'm going to show you this. Why is foreign direct investment an inappropriate vehicle for, trans for, for transformation? One, as a rule, multinational firms do not transfer the most innovative aspects of their business to their subsidiaries. Apple is not going to design the iPhone in Uganda. It will be in California. At best, it can assemble it in Uganda. But if you look at the value chain of an iPhone, Colton will contribute 5% right. to the iPhone, right? Mm -hmm. Assembly is 15%. Mm -hmm. Six at 65% is the design and marketing of the iPhone, which is in California. You can only develop if you control that 65%. That is why China is moving into smartphone manufacturing because if they can't design their own phones, they're they're controlling the phones they, will be, they will remain as middle-income countries. Right. So, so in other words, we need to get a Ugandan firm called Andrew and Cedric Inc. to design a smartphone so that we control the value chain so that 60% or 80% of the total value of the iPhone is maintained in Uganda. So the fact that Uganda government is disinterested, A, in developing private local entrepreneurs, two, in moving from value chain of exporting raw coffee to processed coffee and cotton and other products shows you that Uganda, its struggle with corruption is a wrong struggle. We should, if Uganda focused energies and resources against corruption, we are focused on local ownership, improvement in the value. But we, we, we would say takeoff has been reached. Honorable Frank to members of his ministry, the Ministry of ICT, they have set up innovation hubs that have created some of these people that we're talking about that control this 65% in the value chain. That's, then that's great. Yes, there's, some, there's lots of kids. In I, fact, we as UBC I are clap. going to do a documentary on 13 or 14, 14 of these innovations. So, and I think this is what you're talking yes. about. But I'm still struggling with this whole thing about corruption. You know, are you saying corruption packaged with social responsibility is okay? No, I'm saying or that corruption, the, that corruption has diverted the focus we have on corruption so big. Yes. If that volume of attention was focused on local ownership, value addition would be better off. Not that fighting corruption is a bad thing. I have told you it is morally important to fight corruption and politically expedient. But as a developmental impediment, it is irrelevant. I tell you corruption and its effect is inconsequential to our development. Whether it's there or not is inconsequential. What is consequential is local ownership, and improvement in the value. Now, tell me, you've been very vocal about this, uh, this issue with Bank of Uganda and Crane Bank, mm -hmm. most especially. Yeah. Um, I don't have enough information to, to, you know, to either say Bank of Uganda is wrong or uh, Crane Bank was right. I just read what you write. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I always try and read what you write because it does seem, your journalists like Haggai seem to have balanced opinions and of course i speak to we're always uh, balanced uh, at it, yeah I, I i speak to uh you know some of the mps and you know everybody has a version of events on one hand they say that uh, crane bank had liquidity issues on the other side uh bank of uganda shut down the bank and yet they could have saved the bank they spent 600 million 600 billion uh, when they could have actually saved the bank with 160 billion. And much less than that. Let me explain yes, to you. Much, Let me so give you the figures. I don't know, I don't know the, the story. What, what I want to know. What happened? Let me explain what to happened? you in very few words. On the 27th of July, the central bank wrote to Korean Bank saying you are undercapitalized by 87 billion. 27th of 27th July, of July 27, 2016. 2016. They said you are undercapitalized by 87 billion. Right. And as a consequence, they stopped them from issuing letters of credit, credit notes, new loans. Uh, bank guarantees, uh, bid bonds, practically they stopped them from doing business. I personally went to Agenda and Kasekende. I told them, and Mutabili, you are this bank is so huge, you are restricting it from doing business. If you continue with this policy of stopping them from practically doing anything, you are going to convert an 87 billion capital inadequacy into a 600 billion liquidity crisis. Correct. And that's exactly what they did. They refused to listen because had they allowed the business, the bank to continue doing business, as Sudir looks for money to capitalize it, there would have been no problem. And looking for a, a, another investor to put in money, right. there would have been no problem. So once they had stimulated this, uh, what you call it, liquidity crisis, they had to pump money into the bank because when they stopped it from doing business, customers started taking their money out. So there was a liquidity crisis. Then they put in 475 billion, which they cannot account for what they used it for. 
right? That is one. Two, then they would go to sell it. We had a meeting at State House. The president called the meeting and invited me as a strategic advisor to sit in the meeting. And in that meeting, I told them, if they try to sell that bank by assets, they will open a Pandora's box. If they sell it as a business, they will have saved this country. So what do they do? The central bank deliberately advertised to sell the bank over Christmas on 22nd of December for one week to ask somebody to buy a bank worth $300 million. People could not respond. People were already in Christmas. Yes, I saw the... There were people who came here to buy the bad book of the bank, which was $575 billion. They wanted it to be discounted and they buy it. The central bank blocked them. Having blocked everybody, they went and negotiated a sweetheart deal with the DFC, where they gave the bank to DFC for free, turned on the secretary, turned the bad book, which is a non-performing loan, is worth $575 billion for free to DFCU. And then asked the DFCU to pay them $200 billion over a period of 25 months, of two and a half years, 30 months, 30 months. I mean, it is the most incompetent deal. Let me tell you, there was a lot of corruption in this deal, but that was not the problem. The biggest problem was the sheer impunity and incompetence with which the central bank executed this job. Because this is what I tell people. You see, to be corrupt, you don't need to make anybody lose. Assuming they had said, okay, we have 575 billion worth of a bad book. You give us 400 billion. We will discount. So you're actually saying that this deal did not fall, up, fall on its head because of corruption. Corruption was the smaller yeah. part. Extreme incompetence and impunity so you and saying, stupidity right. is the problem. Yeah. But, you know, I, I mean, I've grown up knowing that many of these there guys was a in lot the of central corruption. bank. Yes. Please, let me, not, let me be very clear, uh, Cedric. There was a lot of corruption in it. But I think in the structuring of the deal, the problem was not corruption because they could have eaten the same amount of money and done a better deal. They ate less money, did a horrible deal that made the taxpayer lose so much. But we're still losing because of what's going on now. Exactly. So tell me, how, in your opinion, how do they close this chapter? Because now it's in Kosaki. The, the I, MPs I are, are taking the them to school. There's all sorts of things coming out every day. I think and the it's wasting the time of the Let me, let me help Uganda. you answer the question. The resolution of this problem is the central bank and Sudir should negotiate out, out of court. Yes. And they compensate Sudir for the bad book or his capital, which they confiscated, which is about 800. Because they had his legacy, per se. Yes. And, and then they sort out the internal problems with the FCU and pay Sudir about 300 billion, uh, 385 billion of his capital, which they confiscated, and it ends there. Because if it continues, I can tell you the incompetence in negotiating this deal will make the courts of Uganda award Sudir a trillion shillings. Because, you know, I think when I look at it, you know, and we read the newspapers every day and we watch the news and, you know, you meet MPs and this is the, this is the thing is that that is the hot topic right now. Of course, closely followed by the new anti-corruption unit at State House and, uh, you know, commissioning of some projects. But I think that the best thing to do would be to, to stop it as it is right now. Everybody takes their losses and let the country continue to grow. Because BOU, of course, the guys are a bit older now. I'm sure they're going to move on and leave space for younger people. I see uh, Dr. Twine is now there as director of supervision. He took over. Uh, oh, you want everything to be stopped? I don't think so. I actually think that many officials of the central bank, I would have said they should be hanged, but let me be soft enough and say they should be jailed for what they did. The mistakes that they made, they must pay for them. I think others would be encouraging impunity. That is one. The second thing is I think it's good for Kwasasa to continue its work publicly because it will allow especially President Seven to act politically against people in the central bank who acted with impunity and with the extreme levels of incompetence and, of course, with fraud of our thought, including lawyers in the private sector who are transaction advisors to the central bank. I think they have serious criminal liability. Why? Because they're working on both sides of the Literally, equation. Look, exactly. These guys passed on a bank for 500 billion of a bad book, 575 billion, for free to, to DFCU. The next day, walked over to DFCU and were hired by DFCU to collect on the money they said was not there. And within five months, they collected 59 billion and got paid about 15 billion. What is that? If you are a lawyer and you cheat your customer, your transaction advisor, there must be punishment, especially of Masembe. I just, I can't, I can't believe that I live in a country that can allow people to exercise that degree of impunity and go away with it. I think that people must pay a price for their crimes of omission or commission. But let me ask something. This wasn't the only bank. And There's been 10 banks. Maybe all of them. 10 banks before them. Yes. What's so special that this bank is causing this sort of crisis? Yes, I know Sudir is... is... Actually, three things. You see, 
Previously, the central bank was closing banks which had small deposits, 22 billion, 30 billion. Yeah. This one had a deposit of 1.4 trillion. <laughs> you right. see, so the size. The second thing I think the person involved with Sudir is a fighter. Yes. Sudir decided to fight back. Right. Previously, they had, the, the central bank used to blackmail you. You see, if you run a business, it's so difficult if you have a forensic audit not to identify fraud. It's not that Sudir was an angel. So there, ma there were mistakes he had committed. Yes. So previously they were using those mistakes to threaten you with jail or send you to jail like did to Chigundu in order to steal your bank. We'll be right back to finish this with Andrew Mwenda. This country is better off with Museveni than these demagogues. Welcome back. We're still here with the old man from the clan. Andrew, you were telling me about uh, this Bank of Uganda issue. Uh, and you so, were... so I felt at that, you see the other banks, the owners had been blackmailed and they kept quiet. But this bank has opened the Pandora's box. It has opened all the crimes that were done previously. And I think it will allow, it has given us an opportunity to solve the problems inside the central bank. And I am 100% certain that after Kosasi, President Museven is going to transfer, to fire so many people in the bank, send so many people to jail, and bring back this country to sanity. Okay. I trust that he will. Now, the other he day... He was... said they lied to him. I was in... He, I attended all the meetings at the State House. They lied, and the lies have been exposed by this Kosasi investigation. The other day I was watching a YouTube clip, and you were sitting on the same stage as Bobby Wine. I can see you're wearing People Power colors today. I am the leader of uh, People Power. Yes. Bob uh, Wayne is my personal assistant yeah, in People Power. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you'll agree to that, but uh, we'll go with that. Now, this is not about Bobby Wine. You've always, you know, when, when, you, when, when we were young, you actually even got incarcerated because of your political opinion. And you were against the government of Uganda. And maybe said some things that they didn't like. Uh, but when I was watching this particular segment, I saw you actually stand up. Well, you didn't stand up, but you were very adamant about the fact that uh, the opposition, uh, FDC, uh, Bobby Wine's people, uh, and all the others lacked ideology. Uh, and basically you said that, the, in summary, it seemed that you, you actually said they wanted change for the sake of change, but there was no substance behind what they were saying. Correct. So I just want you to tell me, explain to everybody on the Cedric Live show, what did you mean? Okay, so Cedric, we have sat, me and you here, I have explained that for a country to develop, it must move away from producing and exporting raw commodities in their raw form to processing them, then to designing them to the highest value. Is that what Bobby Wayne and Vestia stand for? These people are political demagogues. They are on the platform is that Museven has failed. Now, of course, if you're appealing to ordinary persons on the street, it makes sense to them. If you're appealing to a person like me, I consider myself a serious intellectual, I could be wrong and deluded, is you have to make a more serious argument. I can tell you, you said I'm against, I was not against the government. I am a critic of this government. I am a critic of President Yoweri Museven as an individual and NRM as a political organization. Why are you a critic of President Museven? Because, because I'll tell of you the why. things I have told you. I was, that, I was in exile, that, for example. We grew up in exile. Came back here in, in, uh, at the end of the 80s. Where Uganda was... And where it then, is now is different. It's, you know, it, it's like, it, it's, you know, it's... So let me explain to you, Cedric. You see, I am critical of President Museveni because I believe and think he can do better. Yes. And he punches far below his weight. But that's for everybody. Everybody can do better. It, it, true, true. But specifically to him, I think that the government of Uganda needs to be focused on three things. One, local ownership. This country right now is investing the largest amounts of money in infrastructure. We're building dams, highways, flyovers. Yes. You don't have a single local construction farm. I'm telling you, that's a disaster. That's an economic disaster. Yes. Because literally, you are shipping money for construct billions and billions of construction investment back to the owners. Three, the commanding heads of our economy, whether it's banks, telecommunications, insurance, hotels, whatever, is owned by foreigners. That's a disaster. Because every year they will repatriate profits, not only that, they indulge in transfer pricing. So you're saying well, we should three, take the Emirati model. Three, 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 three. There is very little focus by the government of Uganda. The things they put into UPE best scales, that's nonsense on manufacturing. How do we get local farms to enter manufacturing and begin moving us from cotton to cloth to designer clothes? What I told you, from steel, from iron to steel to automobiles. Like Kira, he, he from seven <clears throat> paid as much attention as he does on these other nonsensical things on Kira, that car he talked about. Yes. 
This country in the next 20 years will transform. Anyhow, the bottom line is this. I'm critical for, or, with him on that. Let me tell you, in spite of my criticism of him, when I compare him with Besige and the, this Bobby Wayne especially, yeah. I realize that this country is better off with Museveni than these demagogues because for them, they are so totally out of sync and tuned with what Uganda needs. They lack the basic understanding. Museveni, if, he's, if I give him Museveni 17%, I give Besige 5%, Chagulani, I give him 1.2% of knowledge of what Uganda needs. So for me, the fact that I'm frustrated with Museven does not blind me to the strategic deficits in his opponents. So if I was the one to become president, I don't want to run for president, Ugandans can go on the streets, demonstrate, call upon me to be their president, I can transform this country in just 20 years. I saw a tweet uh, you put up was it yesterday. You see, I follow you, of course. Yes. Uh, you don't follow me as much, but I, I follow. I follow you a lot, yes. and you know it. I, 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 especially I, I, on Instagram. Yes. I think I'm uh, always yes. the first to, li to like your pictures. Yes, especially when I put up women. <laughs> then I know that you, 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 you like that. But anyways, but uh, that's not the point. You see, you talk about a lack of uh, local construction companies. There have been construction companies in they Uganda that, that, no, that have destroyed themselves. No, no, no. no. Do, you think, you. do you think, do you think that, for Can, example... Go, go, please, Senator, let me give you an example. In 2008, American banks, JP Morgan, uh, Morgan, uh, rather, uh, Chess Bank, what is it called, uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, name all of them, destroyed themselves. Did America bury them? They gave them seven one point five trillion dollars to, yeah, to to bring them back to, to life. This them. country, you make a small mistake like this, they want to destroy you. The Chinese companies make mistakes here at home; they are bailed out. The bottom line is this: Karl Popper said, "Human society is inherently imperfect, and a perfect society is impossible to create." So we have to content ourselves with an imperfect society which is capable of infinite improvement. When we make a mistake in Crane Bank or in Zimwe Construction or whoever it is, Dot Services. How do we improve this company? Not how do we destroy it because of its mistake. Okay, but there was a bailout. Let me ask you, you are such a great money. guy. Yes. Don't you have weaknesses? Of course. Don't you make mistakes? Yes. Should you be killed because you made a mistake? No. But anyways, in closing remarks, I want you to give a word out to these young people in Uganda. Young and tell, people. Tell, tell them what they need to do. What to they be must like do. Andrew Mwenda. To <laughs> actually, be like me. The, to be like Sudir and, uh, yes, to be like and Sudir. Cedric. Yeah, no, but I mean, at the end of the day, Sudir, has, Sudir is wealthy, you know, and it's not just wealth that creates the person, uh, but he's done very well, of course. So, younger but, people, I have to run. This is my advice to you. One, hurling insults and abuses at Facebook will not win you anything. I can promise you that. You can go on Facebook and use it as a platform to build social networks. Having good friends, the right connections in the right places, across history and across time and space is always important. Two, jobs do not come from insulting people on Facebook. Jobs come from good jobs and wealth come from acquiring the requisite skills, talents and competencies to be successful in the market. So if you don't have those skills and competencies, please go and try to acquire them. With them, you will succeed. Without them, you will all, you will all, all remain angry, sad, miserable on social media. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, old, the old man of the clan. The born oldest, in 1912. Uh, in six years Port older Porto. than Nelson Mandela. Six years older than Nelson Mandela, rest in peace. And, 32 uh, years older than you in Museven. Yes, 32 years old. That's the length of the... Anyway, so thank you very much. Now for, you know why I supported removing age limits, because I want also to run for president at 100. But thank you very much for coming on the show, Andrew. You're welcome. Thank you.